All right. Well, <clears throat> now it's time to introduce our next speakers. And I am so pleased to welcome Dr. Michael Gregg from the Air Force Research Labs. Dr. Gregg, I'm gonna give you a little bio. It's so impressive. Um, he's gonna be talking to us today about digital transformation. Dr. Michael Gregg is a member of the Senior Executive Service, is the Director of Air Force Systems Directorate at the Air Force Research Laboratories at wright Pat Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. In this capacity, he leads the Air Force Science and Technology Programs in high-speed systems and power and control systems, rocket propulsion, turbine engines, and air vehicles for advanced and next generation space, missile, and aircraft applications. Dr. Gregg is, was commissioned in the Air Force through the Officer Training School in 1988. Over his Air Force career, Dr. Gregg served in a variety of technical management program, uh, technical management and program management staff and leadership positions. He had assignments that covered the entire system life cycle. These assignments include basic research in solid state physics and lasers, missile defense, advanced concept development, C-17 aircraft development and production, MILSATCOM and civil space system development and production, C-5 and C-17 aircraft sustainment and modification. Dr. Gregg retired from the Air Force in 2013 and ranked a colonel after 24 years of active duty. He, is a, he was appointed to senior executive service in 2019. Prior to this, this position, Dr. Gregg was senior associate at the Dayton Aerospace, Aerospace Inc., providing research analysis and strategic planning for the aerospace industry and government customers. Dr. Gregg, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your time and knowledge. Over to you. Thank you, Karen, for that introduction. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have a chance to talk about digital transformation. This topic is so important to our Air Force and Space Forces right now, so this is a very timely discussion. So if we go on to the next chart, I'm, I'm sure if, if I asked 10 people what digital transformation was, I would get at least 20 definitions because it's kind of fuzzy. But I think what we're trying to do is narrow in on that and, and describe how this is really important, not only to us in the Air Force, but to you all as industry partners. And <clears throat> where this is coming from is where you see a lot of industry in, in the bigger industries and it's slowly trickling down from the big companies down into the lower companies down to the very small businesses. Everybody has an opportunity to produce products for the country in this space. And the vision here is we want to be able to deliver new capabilities to the warfighter at the speed of relevance. Well, what does that mean? You know, we're trying to move away from the historical way of doing business where we spend a lot of money and, it, and these programs take a very long time and, and very few people get to play. It's concentrated in the hands of the big contractors but with the advent of, of digital engineering and digital transformation, this opens up space for innovation for anyone who has a great idea to participate. And what we're trying to do here, and once again, is find that sweet spot between military utility and cost effectiveness. And the more we can do that in a digital space instead of in real hardware space, the faster we can go and the lower the barrier is to entry for industry to participate and bring in their new ideas and innovations to the government. So digital transformation includes digital engineering, which is pretty much what it says, uh, model-based systems engineering, and it's uh, all in digital space, in virtual space, and you try and do as much as you can in that space before you actually go to real space and build just what you have to, to reduce risk or experiment in the case of the lab on just what we need to reduce uncertainty or reduce risk. We want to be able to do this because obviously it's cheaper. Obviously, <clears throat> as you look at digital models, once again, the, the physical infrastructure required is, is so much less that it really opens up the space for many, many more people to participate. So if I go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So I've touched on some of this, and if you haven't had the chance to read this paper here that's shown on the left side of the page, There Is No Spoon by Dr. Roper, I would encourage all of you to look at that. You can find it easily on the web. The idea is, I've spoken, is e-create before you aviate. If we can think of how to build a digital century series, the idea is you can we can pay industry to innovate, not to sustain these large fleets of things. If we can do the engineering and do the research and tech advancement at a more rapid pace, then we can afford smaller numbers, but put that previous budget into things that are really meaningful for new innovation. And we can push those new innovations out into the field faster and, and rapidly innovate. So we're not talking about a 10,000 hour exquisite engine that we're going to keep for 30 years. We're talking about <clears throat> maybe an engine that you would put on an expendable vehicle or an attributable vehicle that's got maybe a thousand hours on it. And the reliability doesn't have to be 10 nines. It can be maybe two nines. So there's lots of things to consider here when you're talking about how do we build out the ecosystem in the digital space. And all this is tied together. It's, software, it's digital engineering, it's systems architectures, and how from the lab to LCMC to industry partners to test centers, how do we knit that whole digital ecosystem together? That's where we're at right now and trying to figure out how do we best do that. So next slide, please. What we're trying to do from a, an AMRL perspective is to be a more meaningful partner with industry and with the lifecycle management center. And what do I mean by that? Well, historically we have the silos of basic research and applied research and advanced tech, and we do some demos and, and we may take that advanced demo and, and work with industry or work with the LCMC. And they would say, yep, thank you very much, Mr. Lab. Mrs. Lab, um, but we're going to redo that because you didn't quite do it the way we would like it to. We thank you for for pushing technology, but it's really not what we need to turn into a system for acquisition. So if we can knit the lab and industry and LCMC together with digital modeling and we establish something called the authoritative source of truth that builds in the whole modeling and simulation world and it shows how we progressed from 6.2 to 6.3 and did some demos but we did it with a reference architecture that somebody else is willing to accept and we have the digital artifacts that somebody can ingest into their systems and take it right away and we have this technology pipeline that can produce things on six month, 12 month, 18 month centers that we can rapidly produce and, sh and shift into acquisition. That knits the laboratory environment and the research environment into the acquirer's hands much more rapidly. And so we're shrinking the valley of death. And that truly is what we're trying to do here from an AFRL perspective is to shrink those timelines and to be a meaningful partner and develop technologies that the acquisition programs of record are really looking for. And with a digital environment, that's the opportunity for smaller business to participate. If you have a model of a sensor or you have a model of a material or a certain control algorithm or some piece of cybersecurity software, if we can figure out how to talk to each other in through these reference architectures and through digital space, there's opportunities for you all to have a, a very meaningful impact very soon in this whole life cycle and get those new innovations rapidly into the bigger acquisition life cycle. So we're summary, we're trying to bring the, the bridge, the valley of death here from advanced technology development into something that goes into a program of record. And primarily it's through these digital engineering artifacts or systems engineering artifacts, whether it's a requirement or a con ops, et cetera, that we can take it and we can hand it off and we can transfer that intellectual property from the labs out to a, a business partner or life cycle management center. Next slide, please. This also gives us opportunity in the digital engineering, digital transformation space is to be able to have multiple threads from a research perspective going on at one time. 
So not only are we are we we're moving away from the very serial development of six one to six two to six three, we're kind of pushing all those together and we're able to do some overlaps because the real piece in the middle that holds us together is that authoritative source of truth, the digital thread. And so we can rapidly update and iterate our body of knowledge about whatever it is that we're pursuing from a technology perspective. So once again, it's shrinking timelines. We're not doing things serially as much as we are doing much more in parallel activity. And not only in parallel activity from a technology development perspective, but also we're engaged with industry and with the Lifecycle Management Center much more earlier in the process. So we have a better common understanding of how we jointly do developmental planning and how we define requirements. How do we define those unknown areas that we need to go target for research and development investment? How do we reduce uncertainty and reduce unrisk so that we can much more rapidly get into a program of record? Okay, next slide, please. Digital transformation for AFRL. If you uh, are following all the big Air Force digital campaign, it's being mostly managed here in Dayton through General Cooley's activities and through AFMC. But what AFRL has done is said, okay, how does this whole digital transformation apply to us, to AFRL? Our mission is to do research. So when we apply digital transformation to our context, you're gonna see things differently than what you might see coming out of LCMC or the sustainment centers or the test centers, because we have different missions and how you apply digital transformation in that context really matters. So what you're gonna see from the lab is we're placing a lot more emphasis up front on our ability to model, whether it's a physics-based model or whether it's a mission effect model that we can tie into a bigger, uh, scenario or up into a campaign we're trying to knit all that modeling environment together through the use of models and it's digital collaboration and something we can easily do with you all from industry the government needs to help you all define what those interfaces are and how do we communicate across the digital space how do we protect your ip how do we fold your ip in with others ips but still manage to protect that so that's a big focus from the lab is how do we do research faster? How do we streamline our transitions? How do we make better decisions using data and using AI and machine learning to do decisions? How do we use modeling and simulation to make better investment decisions? So as we knit this modeling and simulation environment together, it's really how do we find out what has the most mission impact? And then how do we complete the cycle and say, how do we define those attributes in terms of things that we can go experiment on or reduce risk or uncertainty? That's the focus of the lab, which is different from the focus of LCMC or sustainment center. We need to be deft. We need to be digital. And what we're trying to do here is absolutely disruptive. We've got to do this and able to accelerate change or lose. So let's go to the next slide, please. A lot on this chart. Uh, but it's an important chart. So I, I, I would ask you to spend some time thinking about this digital thread. And it starts all, back, all the way back in the, the black box there, operational gaps. And how does the laboratory environment and how do we uh, leverage you, a small business, to figure out what those operational gaps are, but what potential enabling technology solutions are? How do we get both red and blue force structures into our analysis? Well, we're going to have to use digital models. And so the more that you can focus on working with government on through the use of digital modeling, MBSE or physics models or mission effect models, the more powerful you will be and the more opportunities there are to insert your technology. But what we're doing way back here when we're looking at operational gaps and enabling technologies is we're starting to build that digital thread and that authoritative source of truth that goes with this concept, whatever it is, all the way up into a TRL 6 plus at the far right end and into a big system acquisition of some kind. So there's absolutely room for small businesses to play in this space. The focus should be on MSNA models and data. 
and and helping us develop that authoritative source of truth and keeping that all together with this digital thread up into uh, so we can pass this intellectual property, this research and development, this tech demonstrations out of the lab and into the industry and into an acquisition. Next slide, please. I think I'm getting close to the end here. So this is, we're trying to do all this seamlessly. And right now we don't have the infrastructure that we need to pull all this together, but we're making some significant investments in the lab to figure out how do we get to our data? How do we manage a data hub and a data marketplace? How do we build out our right MSNA environment? How do we build a new workforce that is data literate and is digital engineering literate? How do we communicate this back to the intelligence community and to the warfighters that this is how we're going to be working in the future? So there's a lot of education here and a lot of building out of infrastructure to help us go fast in this environment. So some of the things are going to be immediately obvious as we go to this more digitally transformed world on how we work with you all and academia. Some of it is not going to be obvious because it's going to be in the background on how we figure out how to manage our data hubs and past data and how do we do low friction business? How do we streamline our, our models for doing research and making decisions on what investments we need to make? Next slide, please. So <clears throat> in summary, what I've tried to paint for you is we are making a significant investment in digital transformation across the Air Force, across the Space Force. And from an AFRL perspective, we're really trying to focus on how do we use these tenets of digital transformation to refine what it is that we do research on? How do we make decisions for technology investments? And then how do we pass on the results of those investments at a much more rapid pace to industry and to LCMC and to other partners? So with that, I think I'm pretty close to the end, Karen, and I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Greg. That was outstanding. Um, for everyone in the audience, uh, give us just a minute and we will introduce you to Dr. Lucky and please stand by also. We will have a QA and a at 945. So we'll be right back with Dr. Lucky. Thank you. Okay.